Hello, my name is Tamsin Harvey and I'm a fifth year medical student at the University of Nottingham. So today I'm going to do a crash course on hip fractures for you. Often medical students find hip fractures a nightmare because there's so many different classification systems and so many different management options to get your head around. But hopefully today I can run through the key points with you and try and simplify it a bit so that it's easy to understand. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start by talking about how hip fractures present the typical features and then I'm going to talk about the blood supply to the hip and how that's important in classification and lastly I'll talk about the management options that are available to us um, to manage hip fractures. So a short case to talk about how hip fractures present, this is Miss GC who's an 80 year old female and she's a retired housewife. She's presented two hours after a fall. She fell on her right hip and following the fall, she had severe pain in her groin and she could not wait there. Also of note, her hip, her right leg was slightly shorter than her left leg and um, the leg was also externally rotated. So an x-ray was performed and the radiograph showed an intracapsular hip fracture. So there are several important features here. Um, first of all, she's an 80 year old female, so that puts her at risk because of her age and the fact she's a woman. Um, the severe pain in her groin and inability to weight bear are typical of a hip fracture. And also the deformity, the shortened leg and the external rotation are very classical features. Um, so as I said, the radiograph showed an intercapsular hip fracture, so I'm going to move on to talk about what that means. So it's important to consider the blood supply to the hip when thinking about hip fractures, and I'll explain why. So as you can see on this diagram, um, we've got the important blood supply to the hip here, which is the median circumflex artery and the lateral circumflex artery. And also on the diagram, the hip capsule is shown. So the importance of that is that the hip capsule and the blood supply are very closely linked. And therefore, if you have an intercapsular fracture, it's likely to involve the blood supply as well, as shown in this diagram. And therefore, that puts the femoral head at risk of avascular necrosis. Whereas, if you have an extracapsular fracture, it's less likely to involve the blood supply to the hip, and therefore there's less risk of vascular complications. So another way we can classify hip fractures is the garden classification. So we've got types 1, 2, 3 and 4 hip fractures, type 1 being the least severe and type 4 being the most severe. And I'll talk about what each one of those means. So type 1 is incomplete undisplaced, so the fracture is incomplete so it doesn't go all the way through the neck of the femur. Type 2 is complete undisplaced, so the fracture goes all the way through the neck of the femur, it's complete. Type 3 is complete partially displaced, so all the way through the neck of the femur and the head of the femur is slightly displaced off the neck of the femur. And type 4, the most severe, is complete fully displaced. So the head of the femur is completely displaced from the neck of the femur, completely malaligned. So that's the most severe. So we can use the garden classification to think about management options. Now this is a general rule, it doesn't apply to every case. Um, but we can use the mnemonic 1, 2, pop in a screw. So put a screw in to try and fix the fracture. 3, 4, head on the floor, so some form of replacing the femoral head. So the different management options available to us, as I said, we've got screws, so dynamic hip screws or cannulated hip screws, or we can do a hip replacement, so the two options are hemiarthroplasty or total hip arthroplasty. Um, and when doing a hip replacement, it's important to consider whether to use cement or not use cement. Um, when considering that, we think about the physiological reserve of the patient and the demand that's going to be put on the hip afterwards. So a more active patient with a greater physiological reserve is more likely to have a cemented arthroplasty. So to talk in a bit more detail about a dynamic hip screw, so it's made up of a lag screw that goes through the femoral head and a lateral femoral plate on the lateral side of the femur. And the lag screw can move um, laterally on the lateral femoral plate. And that means that when force is applied in the hip, when, um, when you weight bear, then it brings the two sides of the fracture together and that allows primary healing of the fracture. Another type of screw is a cannulated hip screw. And this can stabilize the fracture. Um, and it's the, in the hope that you can preserve the blood supply to the hip and also the capsule of the hip. Um, as you can see in the diagram, 
we use three screws and the importance of this is that um, if you've got three screws in there the fracture can't rotate around and if you imagine it um, with th if the hip rotated that could tear the um, capsule of the hip and that would defeat the whole object because therefore as mentioned that will compromise the blood supply to the hip. So um, moving on to talk about hemiarthroplasties this is where you replace the femoral head um, but you leave the acetabulum as it is um, this is a shorter operation than a total hip replacement, but also less robust. Um, so it's appropriate in older patients who are less active, may not put such demand on the hip following the operation. Um, so we can do a cemented hemiarthroplasty as shown here. And you can, see, um, you can see the cement next to the prosthesis and also the plug at the bottom, which stops the cement going any further down. Um, when these operations are done, um, the cement is put in the bone marrow with lots and lots of force. So as you can imagine, that pushes some of the can, push some of the bone marrow out into the blood. And that can be really dangerous because you can get fat emboli in the blood. Um, so there are risks associated with it and therefore it's not suitable for all patients. Um, but it can be very effective in other patients. Um, Another option is an uncemented Austin Moore hemiarthroplasty and it's important if you ever see a patient with this type of hemiarthroplasty, when they had the operation done, they didn't have the physiological reserve to tolerate um, other forms of arthroplasty, so this means they were quite unwell at the time. Because this operation is quick, it can be done in about 20 minutes, so um, good for patients that can't tolerate long operations. Um, as you can see, there are um, areas where the bone can grow within the arthroplasty to help keep it in place, um, and that, that stabilises the prosthesis. And lastly, talk about a total hip arthroplasty. This is where both the head of the femur and the acetab acetabulum are replaced. This is a longer, more complicated operation than a hemiarthroplasty, but it's also more robust, so you get more benefits. Um, but it's also important to consider, although it's more robust, it's not got an unlimited lifespan. They generally last about 10 to 15 years at best. So if you've got a young patient, it's not ideal to be thinking about something like this because it won't last their lifetime. So to summarise what we've talked about, we started talking about how hip fractures present and the key points are um, pain in the groin and inability to weight bear and the classical deformity of a shortened leg with external rotation. We then moved on to talk about the classification system of intracapsular and extracapsular fractures and why intracapsular fractures are worse because they compromise the blood, blood supply. We also talked about the garden classification which can be used to classify hip fractures and lastly we talked about management options being dynamic hip screw, cannulated hip screws, hemiarthroplasty or total arthroplasty. Thank you for listening.